Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Cleaning up the garden in the fall can be one of the best things you can do to reduce insect and disease problems next year. Also, fall is a great time to lime your lawn. That's just ahead of the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Lee Sammons. Lee is a UT Extension agent in Hardeman County, and Mr. D will be joining me later. Hi, Lee. It's always good to have you here. Thanks, Chris. All right, so we're gonna talk about fall garden sanitation because this is the time of the year people wanna know what do I need to be doing out in my landscape? So can you help us out, please? Sure. All right. We're getting into time where we're having frost in our gardens and okay. killing out our uh, vegetable crops that we've had all summer long growing. Uh, and we want to get remove those disease and frost plants that have been killed uh, and clean up the soil and uh, get rid of any grass that may be existing in the garden. Okay. Um, we don't want to carry over those dead leaves in the garden soil right. for next year. So we want to get those removed to keep eliminate disease and insect carryover. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's some other things that we need to be doing as well? Yeah, we're, the, now it's extra time to lime your garden. If you need lime, get a soil test. Yes. Find out for sure uh, what you need to do for next year because okay. it takes about six months for that lime to activate the right. soil and change the pH. So now it's that time you need to pull a soil sample in the garden. Area. Okay, and it can find soil sample kits, you know, in the office here at Shelby County and uh, Hardeman County, of course, right. or at your local extension office. Uh, you can find a soil test kit. Yeah, definitely a good idea to get your soil tested. And if there's a lime requirement, as you mentioned, this is a good time to put down that lime. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And it's real specific now. It lets you know how much lime you need to put down. That's right. Um, so, yeah, you just put that down according, you know, to the recommendation. And I think you'll be fine. Yeah. Now, you mentioned about the leaves. So if we have, like, diseased leaves, uh, you know, in our vegetable gardens, you know, right. for example, so what do we need to do with those diseased leaves? Do we need to put those in the compost pile? No, in, let's in not put trash? anything in the compost okay. pile. Let's uh, bag them up, put them in uh, garbage bags, and remove them from our property. Uh, off there, so don't put them in your compost pile because you, your compost may not get that hot uh, that it actually will kill the disease. So you don't want to infect your soil that yeah. you may be putting back in your garden next year. Okay. Now, since we're talking about compost pile, is this a good time to compost? You think? Uh, yeah, you can put things in your compost okay. bin, but you're not going to get the activity that you will in the summertime as okay. far as the composting. So, how would you determine what you would need to put in a compost pile? versus which you would not need to put in a compost pile. I wouldn't want to put anything that's diseased or grass seedlings and things, because okay. uh, that could be a potential infectation, infection next year in your garden uh, if you didn't get it composted to a high enough temperature that it kill those grass seeds or disease. Would you recommend um, possibly using compost like around your beds and things like that in the fall? Yeah, mulch, you can, you can you mulch in and add, kind of add compost. Maybe you've, you've gotten compost from all summer yeah. and you've got compost. You can add organic matter to your okay. uh, soil. Okay. This is a good time to add organic matter or plant a cover crop that will add organic matter when we till next spring. Okay. So what kind of cover crops would you uh, suggest? Uh, we can put clovers in there. You can put rye uh, in there. Uh, okay. uh, we don't want to let it go to fruition and to seed when we till it up next year. So okay. we don't want to do that. But in the clovers or rye grass or wheat or any of those type things. Would be good, okay. Mm -hmm. And when is the best time to plant those? Uh, now it's a good time, right after frost. Uh, okay. It's a good time to do that. All right, and we do have some publications at the extension office That's about right. those cover crops. Uh, so check with your local extension office about that as well. Something else, right, we've been talking about this uh, for, for a couple of weeks you know, now. So the leaves are falling off the trees, right? Instead of bagging those leaves, would you suggest maybe running those leaves over uh, breaking them down, letting them, of course, be deposited right on the soil surface. How do you feel about that? Instead of just, again, bagging them up and putting those bags on the curve. Yeah, take your lawnmower and mulch them to yeah. a smaller, yeah. uh, cut them up in small, finer chips, and then they'll break down real fast yeah. in, in your garden. Uh, if you put whole leaves in your garden, they're going to be slow to break down, so you want to right. mulch it. Uh, yeah. And you don't want to leave the leaves on your lawn if you've got like a, a grass uh, there, so you want to get them off. But if you've Cut them up with lawnmower, mulch them fine, then you can leave them there and be organic matter. 
Yeah. Building your turf. I used to tell people free fertilizer. That's right. Yeah, why are you putting that fertilizer <laughs> in a bag, you know, on the wow. side of the road? Yeah, so incorporate that into your garden, but it's best to break those down if at all possible. Right. All right. Is it a good time in the fall to actually rototill those leaves into the ground? Yeah, you can rototill the leaves into the ground after you've removed any disease. Right. Uh, vegetable plants that may be growing in the garden. So you can incorporate those uh, shredded leaves into the garden and till them in so that they'll decay over the winter time. Okay. So what should we be doing with our turf grass, you know, during this time in the fall, I think? Um, have we had our last cutting, you know, for the year, you think, or? It, it will, it may have had our last cutting. Right. Uh, I, you know, I wouldn't cut it, scalp it down. Don't cut nah, it real, right. real, real short. Uh, leave the turf there where it can, uh, have a coverage over your yard, not just scalped. Okay, yeah, yeah, so definitely don't scout it. And then something else, this is a good time to kind of go through your landscape, do some scouting, right? right? You know, look for, you know, diseases, insect pests and things like that. Uh, if anybody had any, you know, diseases or insect pests in their landscape at this time, are there anything that you would suggest uh, to use at this time of the year? If anything, how do you feel about that? Uh, you could use a fungicide if you see an active disease or, you know, if you see pests there uh, in your shrub or things that way. You may okay. want to use an uh, insecticide to control or, you know, uh, remove anything that may be a problem now. Right. So just mm -hmm. remove it now. Would this be a good time to use a systemic drench? Uh, yes. You could use a systemic drench um, for some of the insects in there. Uh, we usually do it in the spring, though, right. more than we do it in, in fall. Spring is a better time right. uh, on some of the systemic because we're fixing to go in the winter and the plants are not actively growing, pulling up sap. Right. Where in the spring you get uh, more of a pull of the sap rising and pulling the systemic insecticide up into the trees and leaves at that time. Okay. All right. So let me ask you about tools, right? So now is the time of the year, right? We got to take care of those tools. So how would you suggest that we take care of those? Uh, all of our shovels, rakes, anything that may have soil on it, we want to wash it really good. Okay. Uh, remove any of the soil particles on there because we don't want the rust on our tools. Uh, you can spray like a WD-40 or some type of oil uh, a sealant on those, keep them from rusting over the winter. Get them in the shed. Yeah. Don't leave them out yeah. in the, uh, <laughs> lean against a tree in your garden yeah. area or against your fence. Yeah, you, know, you want to get them out of the weather uh, that way on stuff. But okay. uh, definitely remove any soil that you've got on any of the garden tools now on uh, that. Yeah. And, and you know, in your our motorized garden tools things, yeah. okay. you need to take care of those, you know. Uh, don't leave gas in your gas tank. Yeah, good. Glad uh, you mentioned that. Okay. That type thing. Run it totally empty or, or drain it out. Yeah, drain it out. Or, yeah, if you have uh, trees in your yard, you have those leaves on your lawn, yeah, go ahead and run over you right. know, those leaves with that lawnmower <laughs> to run your gas out. Yeah, yeah. You know, how about that? So, yeah, we just have a little time left, Lee. So, again, you know, some of the things we should be doing in our garden this fall for sanitation is what? Just remove any of the dead uh, disease plants and things uh, off your garden area. Okay. Uh, that will remove any decay of or any disease in the soil. Yeah, because we want to definitely reduce, you know, insect pressure and disease pressure right. going into the spring. Right. right. So practice good sanitation, folks. Pick those leaves up. Don't put them in a compost pile. Put them in the trash. I think we'd be good. That's good. All right. All yeah. right. Thank you, Lee. We appreciate you being here. All right. All right. We're in the garden now in the fall of the year. Uh, you set out sweet potatoes early in the summer, uh, probably in uh, late May and June. Uh, and we've got all these vines just growing all over our garden now in the sweet potatoes, but how do we know that the sweet potatoes are ready to be dug? Uh, you'll see some flowers that are blooming in the sweet potato vines that has no uh, effect as far as the production. They do not produce seed for your potatoes next year. But uh, as we look down in the soil, uh, we'll see that the soil is beginning to crack. Uh, and that is a good indication that sweet potatoes are developing and they're getting closer to being ready to be harvested. So if you start seeing these cracks in the soil, uh, you may want to look and dig just a little bit. So when you move the vines back uh, in the sweet potatoes and you see the cracks, you'll see that there are small sweet potatoes here uh, in the garden and they're ready to be dug. Uh, your vines are destroyed when you dig the sweet potatoes so you're not trying to keep the vines alive. So you dig the sweet potatoes out and do the harvest uh, for your sweet potatoes for the fall uh, and enjoy. All right, Mr. D, we're gonna talk about applying lime. So what is lime? Actually, what we apply on our yards is limestone. Mm -hmm. 
Lime is a, a, a derivative of limestone. When you, when you heat limestone, it creates uh, calcium oxide. Uh, and when you hydrate it, you create calcium hydroxide, mm -hmm. which is also quicklime, which is used in the cement industry. Okay. But limestone is what these lime products are made from. Okay. Limestone is calcium carbonate, very simply. And it comes in several different formulations. The first one that we used for years and years, farmers used, was agricultural ground limestone. Uh, later they came out with dolomitic limestone, yeah, which that. is ca agricultural ground limestone with magnesium in it, okay. which is really, really good if you uh, need magnesium in your soil. And, and most of the time we do need small amounts of magnesium. And so dolomitic uh, agricultural ground limestone is a, a real good product. Um, pelletized lime is very popular with homeowners. Oh, yes it is. And, and the reason is, if you've ever tried to scatter agricultural ground limestone, uh, you can understand that it's kind of difficult to work with. And let me get a little bit out here. It's real fine stuff. Yeah, and I'll show you what I'm talking about here. Let's see here. <laughs> you know, and in the back end of your pickup truck or in that spreader right there it's so fine some of it is so fine that uh, it uh, will actually clog the spreader up so the pelletized lime is a lot easier to spread with spreaders unfortunately pelletized lime is is made up most of the time of very 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 fine particles mm -hmm. which uh, can break down rapidly does a real good job of raising soil pH pretty quickly, yeah. but it doesn't last quite as long. Agricultural wow. ground limestone has particles that will go from between a 10 mesh screen to a, to a 200 mesh mm. screen. And most of them are within the 60 to 100 mesh okay. range, which uh, you have some pretty big particles which take longer to break down. It's kind of a slow release so, yeah, deal. That's what I'm thinking. And, and so if you use agricultural ground or dolomitic limestone that's not pelletized, it's probably gonna take two or three years for some of that lime to take effect, but it's gonna spread, uh, but you do have some fine particles also that will work pretty quickly. Okay. Uh, with, uh, with the pelletized lime, you probably need to check your soil a little bit you know, quicker than three years down the road. Sure. You probably need to check it in two years because okay. It may raise your pH quicker and higher than you expected it to a little bit, uh, and then, you know, kind of fizzle out okay. you know, at the end of that two or three year period. Okay. Well, look, so we get our soil test results back from the lab, Miss Debbie. Got right. one right here. And yeah. she tells us we need to add lime. So, mm -hmm. where do we go from and there? And you can see here, uh, it's 1.5 pounds per 100 square feet. The pH, water pH, is what you look for. Right. And it's 5.9, which is not really <laughs> really too acid. Not too bad. Uh, you know, you, you like most of our vegetable crops in Bermuda grass, what, you want it between 6.5, 6.2 6 to yeah, 6.5. So the, the, the recommendation is one and a half pounds per 100 square feet. Well, I understand we've got about a 4,000 square foot mm -hmm. area here that we're, we're going to need to be applying lime to, and this is where the soil test was taken. Okay. And so to, to figure that out, uh, one and a half pounds per 100 square feet, we we'll get it to the thousand square foot range. It's 10.5 pounds, mm -hmm. one, uh, and then it's 4,000 square feet. Multiply that times four, so it's four, 42 pounds. 42 pounds of, okay. of uh, lime is, is limestone is what we need to put out right okay. here, and and it, that's really handy because this pelletized limestone that we have here came in a 40 pound bag, so it's, so it's almost right perfect. There'll be no no waste. You won't have one of these sitting in your garage for the next 10 years <laughs> like I did. I think. All right, so you're going to demo how we're going to spread. Limestone, That's right. right. Okay. And and before I do that, okay. what I like to do with a spreader, and this is with fertilizer or with lime, I like to start with a low rate because the worst thing you can do is pour a bag of fertilizer or lime in a, in a spreader like this and get about a fourth of the area covered <laughs> and you're out of, uh, you've I used up all that. the recommended yeah. rate. So uh -huh. you've got a really, really high rate in some areas and nothing over right. here where you need it. That's smart though. So I try to put a half out at one application going in one direction okay. and the other half going directly, you know, 90 degrees, different direction. Okay. So let's go ahead and go with this and I'm gonna, Dang, I'm gonna here. set this, uh, right here. I guess I'm gonna set this on about 
five. I, I really don't have a clue. I don't know how, so I'm gonna go low rather than high. And that's got that open about a third, 30% okay, of those okay. openings there. Okay. All right. Is that your old trusty spreader right there? Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. trusty pocket knife here. And your pocket knife. That all farm boys had <laughs> when I was growing up. and Used to carry them to school. You had to have a pocket knife with you. Can't do that nowadays. No. I notice, I notice this pelletized lime is also dolomitic, and that's a good thing. Okay, we're moving right now. So let me turn oh, that yeah. off. That's I notice I'm going control. down. Okay, I'm gonna start going long ways and I'll get a feel for how far it's spreading. I think it probably throws at least a six or eight foot spread. Okay. So I'm probably, I think I'll just walk down the middle first. Alrighty. That little spot right there right, got limed really well. <laughs> It'll be high. So here we go. <laughs> All done, all done and all through. So you got it finished, right? Got it done. All right. Now, does that need to be watered in or anything or we let Mother Nature handle uh, that? Mother Nature will take care of okay. that. Okay. I wouldn't worry about it. What my hands, uh, it will uh, do a good job of taking it on down. I mean, these products are water soluble you know, to some extent. Mm -hmm. And so Mother Nature will take it on down. If you want to speed it up a little bit, it's okay to irrigate. You know, okay. if you want to speed the process up a little bit, but. Not necessary. Not necessary. And again, how long do you think before we see some improvement in the soil pH? You should see uh, some improvements I mean, with the pelletized lime, uh, you know, fairly quick. I mean, this okay. is the fall of the year, so next spring, if you check your pH, I guarantee you'll be better next spring than it is right now. So be ready to go? Be ready to go. All right, Mr. D, we appreciate that demo. <laughs> it was All right. Fun. Thanks. All right, catch your breath. <laughs> yeah, my breath here. Hard work for an old man. <laughs>
It didn't seem to help. This year I was told to drench with done dishwashing detergent. That didn't seem to help. My wife thinks they have just gotten old, but I'm hoping I could save them. What can I do? Thank you. And this is Kim from Bahalia, Mississippi. So, uh, and thank you for that picture, uh, Ms. Kim. Uh, so what do you think about that? So here's my thing, they're, they're losing the leaves, right? But we're drenching with malathion. So Which are is, we saying that there's an insect problem? Right. Uh, that's would not be the treatment uh, <laughs> if it's a disease problem. Right. Because uh, you're using a uh, insecticide. Yeah. And if there's a root problem, that's going to be a fungus or something that way. Right. You're going to need a fungicide for right. not an insecticide. Right. Uh, but 20 years is pretty old. Uh, but it, we've had a severe winter last year, too. And it could be uh, cold damage from that standpoint. Uh, too, as well as a potential root problem being mm -hmm. 20 years old mm -hmm. um, that way. Um, but you know, you can always cut it back and the viburnums have a good resilience to come back if yeah. they've been cut back. So that would be a potential that what they could do. Yeah, I would definitely cut out the dead. You know, oh, yeah. just looking at the pictures, I, I would cut that out. Yeah. Uh, probably come back in the spring with some fertilizer to see if you right. rejuvenate it a little bit. Uh, but yeah, if it's losing leaves, I'm thinking the same thing you are, right? It's probably something in the root system because you kind of look at where it is, right? right. It's kind of like in that little, you know, encasement in there. Uh, so could it be, you know, water injury? You know, could it be you, you watered it a little bit too much? Uh, but I would definitely cut out the dead. But yeah, using malathion and then the done dishwashing liquid, you would do that, you know, if you had problems with like insects, aphids, right. you know, scales or something like that. But the thing about, you know, the burning bush, I mean, they they can have problems with scales, yeah. but you just have to make sure the scales are there. Uh, and then of course you can use these means. Um, but yeah, if it's losing leaves, I will look for scales. It, it may be root rot, uh, twig blight, you know, something else that just popped into my mind that burning bushes are susceptible to, but that's because of overwatering. Right. Right. So those are the things I would look at, uh, Kim, but I would definitely get out there and cut them back. Yes. That's the first thing I would do. Yeah. So cut them back and then in the spring, Let's see if we can uh, give them a little fertilizer right. and see if that'll help it out. All right? Yeah, all but right. no more drenching with melatonin and done dishwashing liquid, <laughs> all right? <laughs> Thank you much. All right, here's our next viewer email. I'm wanting to plant tulips this fall. What is the best way to deter chipmunks and squirrels from eating tulip bulbs? And this is Lori from Knoxville, Tennessee. Well, Lori, you know, Mr. Lee knows a little something <laughs> about planting tulips. Uh, but do you know something about deterring those chipmunks and squirrels as you're doing that? Yeah, I would, ah, buy, okay. I would go to the hardware store and buy some um, chicken wire, uh -huh, uh, uh -huh. which has about an inch opening, uh, and cover that after you planted the tulips, and then cover that nice. up with mulch. So the squirrels can't dig through that wire and dig up the tulips. So chicken wire, uh, I wonder if you can use hardware cloth. Hardware cloth might be a little bit too Mid small okay, over too small. Okay. opening uh, in it for the tulip. Uh, foliage come okay. out through. Good deal, because you want the foliage to come through, right? right? Right. So with that being said, I do know some master gardeners that have actually planted tulips in little cages. Right. Right. But the cages are, of course, big enough to allow the, the foliage, foliage to come up through it. Right. Right. So yeah, I would definitely, yeah, probably go the route of the chicken wire or maybe the little cages, the little baskets. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Make sure you plant them deep enough. Um, yeah, because those chipmunks and squirrels can be tough. Yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> There's no uh, chemical re remedy mm. that you can do that. You just have to do a physical right. Uh, barrier. Right. So just cover that area, and I think you'll be fine, Miss Lori. Because yeah, those yeah repellents, no, no they hit or miss. They because yeah, we, we're talking about outdoors, right? Yeah. So yeah, if it rains or anything like that, you put those repellents down. They just wash out. You have to reapply. Don't work yeah. that well. All right. Thank you, Miss Lori. We appreciate that question. Good luck to you. All right. Here's our next viewer email. I have a Satsuma orange tree that is about 25 years old. The good news is that it produces oranges. The bad news is that there are about a million of them and they're less than the size of a golf ball and very bitter. Is there any easy way to reduce the number and increase the size of my Satsuma oranges to what is typically found in a grocery store? Thanks, and this is Gerald from Tucker, Georgia. So, hey, Satsuma, 25 years old. She's still doing good. Still produce a million, right? But they're yeah. so small, right? So is there an easy way to reduce the number and then to increase the size? Yes, you can hand thin them. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of our fruit trees will overproduce, uh, produce so many blooms and set so many fruit yeah. that point. they don't size up. And so they need to be thinned out to have less fruit trying to grow right. in that one limb. Yeah. Uh, and they're going to be small if they're over 
uh, produces fruit on oh, that yeah. one limb. Yeah, without and a so, doubt. Yeah, on those. But ha I would hand thin them out. Okay. Uh, and follow culture of fertilizing maybe yes. help. Uh, yeah. You know, that. Uh, no, I would agree with that. I would definitely check the uh, fertility for sure. Yeah, because now you know Mr. D is in my head. You know, we talk about fruit trees. He always talks about proper fertility, of right. course. Proper irrigation is something he always talks about, or watering. And then the last thing he always mentioned, thinning. Yeah. Yeah, you got to thin them, right? Yeah. Uh, and I know for some, you know, you know of course, this, you know, this pertains more to like peaches. He would always say like one fruit, you know, for every 12 inches of shoot. Yeah. Uh, this one probably not that much. Not that much. Not probably. that much, but you're definitely gonna have to thin it back, yeah. right? If you want to get that grocery store size, right. that summer orange that you're looking for. Uh, so thinning is gonna be key to that. So thinning, fertility, make sure you get the water um, that it needs, and I think it'd be fine, right? But yeah, doing good, 25 years. 25 years, you've done something right. <laughs> you've done something right, you know, down there, you know, in uh, Georgia, you yeah. know, where we get a, uh, you know, a lot of those peaches down that way. Uh, but to have an orange after 25 years, I think it's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. You don't want clusters of oranges. They're not grapes, so you want right. Right. thin fruit. Exactly. Right, exactly, right. You want to thin the fruit, that is for sure. So uh, thank you for that question, Mr. Gerald. Yeah, do check with your local extension office there. They may have a publication about right. growing set summer oranges down there. It will help you out with the thinning that we're talking about and the fertilization as well. So thank you much. All right, Lee, that was fun. All right, thank good, you. Chris. All right, thank you much. All right. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplots at wkno.org and the mailing address is familyplots 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching. If you want to learn more about anything we talked about today, head on over to familyplotgarden.com. We have tons of gardening information there. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.